Now, this afternoon, we've got um, a couple of series of interviews. We're starting with John Page and Munz Soderbaum. So I would ask them to come join me over here. Gentlemen, if we could begin. We're here to talk about firm dynamics in job creation. And John, I'm going to start with you. And basically, why do we care? We care because whether it's advanced economies or, in fact, developing countries, small enterprises are big business. Uh, McKinsey estimates that uh, certainly in low and middle income countries, between informal firms and formal small firms, let's say those with fewer than 30 employees, 90% of people work in that sector. We also care because, at least in US politics, and it can't be lost on anyone who's been following the current presidential campaign, and I would argue also in the UK, where I know things, perhaps here in Denmark, it is routine for politicians to say that small firms are job creators. It's the small enterprise sector of the economy that actually creates the most jobs. So if you take the opportunity to create jobs, and you take the instrument, which is the fact that we have money for development finance, it's not too surprising to find out that there are some 300 firms today, some official, some private, some public-private, all devoted to filling the, quote, financing gap between small-scale enterprises and their needs for, for capital. So it's a big business in the aid industry to focus on small enterprises to create jobs. Okay. And it shouldn't be? Mm, yeah, it shouldn't be. Let me be frank. It's right after lunch. This is only John's opinion, mind you. Of and course. Months. I'm yeah. a, not mine. Um, and the reason why we need to have a little bit more subtle approach to job creation through industrial development than just focusing on small enterprises has to do with something we've always known about but haven't been able to deal with very much. And that is what's important is not gross job creation. Because if a job is created, and then a firm fails, and the job is lost, and then another firm starts up, and the job is recreated, the number of jobs seem to be quite large. But in terms of the quality of work, the duration of employment, and the security of tenure for the worker, just churning through the labor market in a series of successes and failures is not exactly what you would hope for when you entered the labor market. So what we're really worried about is net job creation. What happens when a firm is created? Does the job remain? For how long does it remain? And what kinds of wages and conditions of employment does it offer? And on that one, the evidence is much more mixed in terms of the role of small-scale enterprises than is the case with respect to just gross job creation. Okay, the good job, bad job thing and the difference between big and small firms, can you elaborate a little on that? Well, let me tell you what the U.S. evidence shows, and this was really, in a way, the inspiration for the work that Munz and I were doing. Uh, Martin Rama mentioned John Haltwanger, who, in fact, has been an advisor to the World Bank on this. Very recently, he and a number of colleagues were able to get a hold of data that covers the lifespan of firms in the United States. You can't imagine how big this data set is. Uh, it's the sort of thing that now you can do on a PC that in my day you would have had to fill up a mainframe to do. What they found was very interesting. What they found was that the number of jobs that were created by small firms was larger than the number of jobs that were created by all other firms. But the number of small firms that died was also much larger than the number of other size firms. Net-net, there is no relationship in the United States between firm size and employment creation. Large firms and small firms create jobs, net jobs, at approximately exactly the same rate. On top of that, what they found was that in terms of any other condition of employment, large firms were able to offer jobs of superior quality to those of small firms. So what they came out was to say, let's have a little less loose talk from the politicians. Let's talk about the need to find dynamic firms, to find firms that are capable of growing, and to find firms that are capable of finding good jobs, regardless of size. Let's think more broadly about the job creation problem than just going for one simple criterion. So Mons and I thought, well, let's see if we can find out a little bit about that in Africa. Maybe it's different, maybe it's the same, but we really don't have any hard evidence on that at the moment. 
So, Munz, that's when we come to you, our, our man in Africa. <laughs> was it the same? Yes, pretty much. Um, but I should start with a caveat on all this. Uh, as John hinted here, the demands on data are really, uh, they're really very strong. So if you live in this palace of data, which is the United States, then you can do this kind of stuff that John Haltiwanger and his collaborators have been doing, and it's very informative. But for those of us who uh, have to work on African data, we have far less information. So um, having said that, I can just show you what we've got um, and uh, get going. So what we're doing in this paper is basically to a, a comparative analysis. So we're comparing uh, the performance of small and large firms, and in particular, their ability to generate good jobs for uh, its employees. I want to start by putting some facts on the table. Um, I said a couple of, uh, well, I said earlier that we don't have a lot of data that comes with the qualification. It's we don't have data that enable us to follow firms over time. If you want data on a cross-section of firms in Africa, then, you know, you live in a type of palace as well. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that that doesn't uh, tell you a lot about firm dynamics. So what are the two sort of most striking facts if you compare large and small firms in the cross-section? I want to highlight two facts. One is that there are enormous productivity differentials between large and small firms. So if we focus the comparison on, you know, you compare a firm with 100 employees to a firm with 10 employees. And let's just look at something really simple. Uh, and the first thing we're going to look at is uh, labor productivity. So this graph illustrates the value added per worker as a function of firm size. Basically, if you work in a firm with 100 employees, on average, that firm is three times as productive as the firm with 10 employees. Okay. That also spills over onto wages. Uh, so this shows, this is a similar graph, it shows the relationship between firm size and average wages in nine African countries, I should have said. These are Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, Rwanda, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria and Senegal. So fairly, you know, it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, east, okay. west and south. Yeah. So, again, it's not as dramatic as for productivity, but we see here that the firm with 100 employees pays on average twice as high wages as the firm with 10 employees. Okay. Okay? So that's sort of, I want to set the scene by just showing you some striking facts in the cross-section before we get to the more interesting discussion, is, which is about how these firms uh, develop over time. Okay, now you're going to look a little bit focusing in on Ethiopia, correct? Yes, uh, and the real and reason. Why, yeah. And why? Yeah, yeah. So the real reason why we're looking at Ethiopia is very simple. This happens to be a country where we have exceptionally informative data that enable us to follow firms from birth for almost a decade. It's true. It's a, you know, it's a very specific uh, sector in the economy. This would be formal manufacturing firms in Ethiopia. So this, you know, in terms of their contribution to overall employment, this is not huge, okay? So which firms are successful? So which firms were successful? So let's look at today's large firms, right? These are the high productivity firms, the high wage firms. And let's in particular look at firms that have been in operation for eight years. And then let's just rewind and see how did they become successful, and in particular, how did they start out life, right? Because one of the, I hesitate to say myths, but it, you know, I'd say it anyway, <laughs> is, is that uh, these firms that start small tend to grow and become successful large firms. So where do they come from? If we rewind this, you see that the origins are basically that they started large. A couple started small. Yes, a couple. I mean, come on, this is, uh, this is very complex, but it's unusual for uh, small firms to uh, stay in the market and grow for eight years. Okay, so I think we've already done the small firms that started small actually grow, right? So this is a beautiful piece of 
modern art when you see it at the end. But yes, I want to make sure explained. that we're in the middle here. Well, yes, we get, we're just getting started. So I should have said, so on the vertical axis, it's just number of employees, and then time is on the uh, horizontal axis. And do you want to look at the dy dynamics of small firms? OK. And now we're going to start from birth. So I've selected a subset of firms that start very small with less than 15 employees. And do some of them grow quickly? Yes, they do. Some grow very quickly and become large firms. But, scroll back on that one, right? So in terms of job growth, this particular class of firms generate a lot of new jobs, for sure, right? So you have firms there employing 40, 50, 50, maybe even 70 firms after eight years. But the typical development for these firms is very different. Failure rates are very high. And this then is exactly the same point as John explained for the American setting, where uh, you know, if you take into account the failure rates and the growth rates you know, on balance, small firms do not create more jobs than larger firms. What you're saying is that for every Microsoft, there are a lot of Microsofts we never heard of. Is of that course. it? Yes. Okay. But basically, the, 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 the relationship is the same in the States as it is in Africa. Qualitatively, yes. Yeah. And okay. I sh yeah. again, this is Ethiopia, yeah. a very particular sector. Is this true for Africa? We don't know. We don't have the information. Okay. Um, but this is all we've got at the moment. So you can see here the dynamics of small firms is really quite complex, but in a way it's simple, right? You either succeed or you die. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like live or die, but yeah, that's yeah, a James Bond around. movie, isn't it? Okay. So this is wow. the full picture, enterprise dynamics in Ethiopia. So this is where we've actually tracked about 150 firms from uh, you know, the year of birth and tracked them for, for eight years. Uh, and you see that, so these, these lines that uh, crash to the bottom, obviously, those would be firms that go out of business. Uh, it's certainly true that larger firms go out of business as well, but it's much less common. Okay. And then you were mentioning that, that um, smaller firms actually die faster than bigger firms. Yes. It's just... Yes. Yeah, it's obvious from the yeah. graph, isn't it? And, and in particular, I think maybe if you could just tell us what you mean by a large firm in Africa. Well, um, I think one thing that is important to keep in mind, that if we are using international standards to uh, categorize firms, nearly all firms in Africa would be small or medium-sized. Right? So I think if I may scroll back a little bit here, if we have the time, if you look at, uh, it's a bad idea, but if you look at uh, the, these types of patterns, uh, performance patterns, wage patterns, uh, you see there's a lot of difference if you compare firms with 10 employees to firms with 100 employees. Once you go beyond 100 employees, it doesn't much matter. They okay, so 100 similar. is basically your line. 10 and 100, a lot okay. happens, right? And there's even a big difference between ten, a 10 man firm and a 30 man firm. Okay, what about, what about the, wage, the wage gap? Because yeah. you mentioned that. So the wage gap, of course, is one main reason why we, uh, why we care about these things. And to a large extent, of course, they, the wage gap um, reflects skill differences. Right? Larger firms hire more experienced staff, they hire better educated staff. Uh, but that's not the entire truth. To some extent, this also reflects the productivity uh, of these two types of firms. So here, this we, we just uh, try to, using a similar methodology, we track average wages for two types of firms, if you like, from birth for eight years. So basically, if Joe gets hired by a startup of 10 employees and his brother John gets employed by a startup size of 100 employees, John is always going to earn twice as much as Joe. That would be, no yes, on average. I on mean, average. we are oversimplifying, I, right? But, yes. But, hey, but work in television. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, I think we go back to John now. Yeah. Final comment, John. So, what does this, what does this mean? Well, two points. The first one is, 
let's be very careful with single targets. There's a, a love, and I can say this after 28 years in the World Bank, actually operating divisions, I managed five of them. We like an easy target. And we like an easy target because it's simple to explain and because we can get some resonance. So an easy target is let's intervene to promote the growth of small-scale enterprises because small-scale enterprises are job creators. It ain't necessarily so. Because it ain't necessarily so, it means that we need to think much more carefully about what it is we're trying to do. Now, as Mons, who is always much more cautious than I am because he's Swedish, of course, um, is it pains to point out. We're working off one country, a relatively small sample, but the best data for Africa that are available. What I find extraordinary in the first instance is it mirrors what we find in very good data from advanced economies. Maybe developing countries aren't that different in this part of the story. I, I, okay, I just have to throw a grain of salt into this, or sand. Um, would it have something to do with, or, or where would you put in the fact that in developing, many developing countries, a lot of the big firms are either state-owned or... Well, again, if we're just thinking about what do we do in terms of an intervention for aid policy, the good news is that large-scale firms tend to survive. They tend to offer good employment conditions, and they tend to um, offer better security of tenure. That says to me, one of the things we talked about before the break, we need to have a strategy for how we get better foreign investment and more foreign investment into Africa than just mineral resources. We all know the limits of the state. And here there are some state-owned firms, but the state-owned firms aren't the story anymore. The question is, what is the private sector doing? Okay. If we come back to the story of what is a target, I mean, if I had to pick a target, which is more difficult to explain, what we're really looking for is firms with the capacity to grow. So that's harder, because we have to try to find a way of identifying those. A thought. We talked about financial constraints to firms. What about if we gave a small grant to a large number of firms simply randomly chosen? Waited two years until we saw who survived, and then targeted the assistance of the type that Kay and Tetsushi and others are going to talk about to those firms who are the survivors. If we could get a slight increase in the number of rapidly growing firms, even though they're small, we would get a major increase in the amount of employment generated. But if we leave things as the status quo, we'll have pretty much the same amount of employment creation as we've seen in the past. Okay, in a moment now, I'm gonna start taking some questions, comments from the floor and of course from the panelists. I can see buttons starting to go. So please, if you have a question or a comment, um, first of all, I would like to start with Klaus Bustrup. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, I understood that small is beautiful, but uh, big is better. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we have, we're talking about job creation, uh, but this morning also job transition was mentioned. And John Page talked about structural change. Uh, most jobs, in fact, are within uh, agriculture. Uh, and uh, if we want to secure food security, there is a need for structural development, structural change in agriculture. Uh, it is necessary to increase productivity. But if we do so, at least in the short term, we risk to reduce employment. And I wonder whether John Page could expand on this. Um. I'm not sure we risk to reduce employment, but since our concern right now is really on a particular aspect of the aid business, which is lending for small-scale enterprises that are not in the agricultural sector. It could be rural off-farm employment. I think the issue is you need a balanced approach. We've talked a lot about the need to raise agricultural productivity, and no one would disagree. The question is here, if you have 300 various types of social and private enterprises created for the purpose of lending to small-scale firms, it sounds to me like we've already made a decision about what should be the objective of policy in this other part of the economy. And I'm just a bit worried that we haven't done it with a good basis of facts. Mr. Siddharth Sareen. Am I on? Yep. Yeah. Okay, my question's are about illegal financial flows and for instance, through 
inflation prices of imports so as to transfer funds to developed countries from developing country contexts. And that's quite important in terms of development, regardless of whether it relates directly to jobs or not. And I'm curious to see uh, whether you consider this in any way, especially since data is probably, are probably never going to be very good on this. Am I clear enough? Yes. Um, I think that certainly if you talk to the <laughs> managers, I've been doing some field work in Kenya a while back, and uh, you, know, you hear lots of anecdotes of exactly what you're describing here, presenting a big problem. How can we get data on this at the micro level? Uh, I think that would be very challenging. Um, but I think you know, it's a problem that is not to be underestimated. Martin Rama. It's, um, I would like to, to get a reaction from a kind of provocative or dissenting comment to see uh, how it works. Um, you said industrial countries are the palace of data. Unfortunately, we have this palace of data in Ethiopia. At the same time, we said, you said all oh, these for manufacturing firms in the formal sector, which makes us think is a bit small. We conducted for the World Development Report this exercise, which is to reconstruct the distribution of firms out of household surveys, where people say, oh, I work on my own, or I work in a small company, and from plan level surveys like the one you use in Ethiopia. If you do that for an industrial country, you get the same story. You do that for a developing country, you don't get the same story. And we did this in detail for Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Chile. And even the story of who creates jobs and all that is one that is different. Our conclusion uh, was that, in fact, it is not like industrial countries. And it is not like industrial countries in two ways. One, which you showed clearly, is that in developing countries, we have a very nice comparison, Ghana versus Portugal. In developing countries, firms are born large and stay there. In uh, industrial countries, the dynamics come from the gazelles, these things that are born in garages and they may be called Honda or they may, may be called Microsoft. And where, where the big difference is that there is much more churning in developing countries and much fewer gazelles. And so if you ask me for a developing country, should you target the big ones or the small ones, I would say uh, that's not the question. The question is how we make the distribution function as an industrial country so there are more gazelles and fewer big firms that live out of privilege. Just clarify, I didn't hear a word. Yep. Just clarify, you said there's more churning in developing countries? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Okay. Uh, wait a minute, Martin, you said there was more churning in developed countries. No, in developing countries. Developing, developing countries. Yeah, in developing countries, you have a lot of these dynamics that goes okay. nowhere that okay. you described, and, and yeah. fewer of the gazelles, fewer of the Hondas okay. and the Microsofts. Yeah. No response. Okay, well, the no, next one. A, I mean, from a policy point of view, we're saying the same thing. Mm. Okay, which fine. Which is look for the potential to grow. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Karen Norberg. The, yeah, I just wanted to know, is capital for big firms really the bottleneck? Is it the bottleneck for development? Capital. Oh, for big firms? Yes. No. no. Okay, so why focus aid on the big firms? No, I didn't say that. I said uh -huh. besides neutral. Okay. If Hillary had given us enough time, we would have given you some ideas <laughs> about how to be size neutral. But since Blame you opened, the moderator. Oh, of course, <laughs> the immoderate moderator. Um, yeah. but, but since you've opened the door, I mean, we can go back to a couple of things we talked about before. One is the investment climate. We're back to that. We're back to infrastructure and skills. Uh, the second one is, I, I promise that we talk a little bit about capabilities, and I don't want to steal what Kay and Tatsushi are doing, but... Uh, the new literature on management training coming out of the business schools suggests that we've really neglected the idea that you can actually increase the capabilities of firms, regardless of size, though you might need different skill sets for different sizes of firms. Those would be two ideas that would be size neutral, but pushing more toward Martin's dimension of let's find the gazelles, wherever they're born. Okay. Martin. Well, if... Uh, Martin if, Elcher, sure. if, uh, if small... Small firms uh, face uh, uh, more uh, market uh, imperfections. For instance, they don't have access to capital as, as, as bigger firms have. Um, then, I mean, you're presuming, I guess, that everybody is sort of working under the same, the same, the same conditions. But if this is not the fact, you say we should focus on, on, on firms that can grow. So the, the interesting question is, what are the constraints, the market imperfection, that prevent the small, uh, small businesses uh, to, to grow if they're different than the, than the big ones? 
So I mean, you, you, we need to do more, uh, I think, analysis before we can really uh, get any policy conclusions from your, your, your paper. Absolutely. Um, I think that's extremely interesting. I've been doing some work in Rwanda uh, recently, uh, which of course is a landlocked country uh, and where transportation costs are enormous. So if you want to do business profitably in Rwanda, you better be large scale because they're going to be significant and high fixed costs of doing business. So this is just one example of where the market imperfections or the business environment more generally uh, sort of disadvantages the, 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 the small firms. So the small firms, yes, they can live their lives supplying the local market because that by definition doesn't involve big transport costs, but they are going to struggle big time if they will attempt to grow and supply more distant markets. Finn Tarp. Thanks a lot for some interesting points. I have a couple of questions which I'd like to sort of kind of reflect on and maybe elaborate on. Before I can buy you a story, I need to understand where the large firms come from. Who are they? Which background do they have? And I'll motivate my question by saying that in the case of Vietnam, one of the findings that we have is that there are quite a number of firms that switch. In other words, firms live their life, they die. No, they don't die. They close their business in one sub-manufacturing sector, then move to another sector. Now, that's not caught normally, so I'm just sort of challenging you a little bit to what if the large firms that you're talking about were previously small, they closed because from your data, they close before they enter the new sector? So I'm just sort of interested in understanding that because is that where the missing link is? Okay. Well, we've, we've looked into that. Uh, it's a very good question. Again, we've done it for, well, John Sutton has been doing this enterprise maps for, uh, I don't know how many African countries now, but uh, a bunch of them. And we've been doing similar work in Rwanda. So I'll, I'll focus on Rwanda, which I happen to know uh, some things about. And if you look at like the 50 uh, most successful firms today, the largest firms, the firms that manage to export, two thirds of them started life as uh, groups. So either, either uh, Rwandan uh, conglo conglomerates or, or foreign groups uh, and uh, also foreign entrepreneurs. So, uh, and the remaining 33%, if you like, would be in this case for Rwanda, uh, what you're describing here, uh, i.e. firms that started fairly small and that managed to grow in, in Rwanda. That's different and uh, if you compare that to Ethiopia, we see much less of growth from, uh, from, from, from sort of uh, firms that started small initially. So I think, you know, there's a, a lot of work to be done on these things. And I think that these patterns will vary quite a bit across countries in Africa. Uh, and as I say, I think these patterns will also uh, differ because of differences in the market imperfections and, the, and then the business environment. Okay, um, Sung Young Park, and uh, um, you have the last one. Yes, um, I would like to ask about the, um, as I come from South Korea, South Korea is um, one of the few countries successfully used the foreign um, to to for the development. And I want to ask you, John, about the, as the kind of East Asian industrial policy kind of invest uh, kind of governments to um, kind of uh, finance these the heavy industry the conglomerates or big firm to grow and to lead the economy it, it, this kind of a policy can kind of uh, can give a lesson to the, the African countries to use the foreign ads um, yeah I don't think North Asian industrial policy is very easily transferred to Africa um, having said that you need a strategy for industrialization. And that, to my mind, is the real lesson of East Asia. I mean, the different policies in different countries, Taiwan was very different from Korea, for example. Malaysia and Thailand are very different. But in each case, governments have strategies. One of the responses that one often hears when you say, well, you need a strategy is, but isn't that picking winners? Isn't that intruding? And my answer is, every day governments make decisions about strategy. 
as soon as you have a budget discussion and you decide to add a lane to the road to the port as opposed to building a feeder road, you've made a decision that favors one group against another. The question is, do you have any idea of where you want to go? And my argument would be, in most cases in Africa, there isn't a coherent idea of where you want to go. So I think what we're advocating, in a way, is if part of where you want to go is to accelerate this process of structural transformation, then you have to think about how you use the orthodox instruments of public policy in a coherent way to get there. You don't necessarily need a new, quote, industrial policy. Thank you very much. Thank you.